Hello, in the previous video we discussed that um, Tesla's AC system is much better than Edison's DC system. This is because high voltage transmission is much more efficient than low voltage transmission. Now the reason why Tesla can achieve high voltage is because Tesla has this device called the transformer. Oops, nah, that's the wrong picture. Yeah, this is the correct one. Yes, the transformer is uh, just two coils of wires wrapped around a soft iron core. And this simple, humble looking device is crucial in making AC the winner in the war of currents. Now, before I explain the operation of the transformer, let me use this applet to remind you of the electromagnetic induction. So we have here a coil that has an AC current running through it. So it's producing this magnetic flux that's uh, illustrated by the magnetic needles here. I can bring up a compass and you can see the compass needle switching around. Let me put the compass uh, here so you can see the magnetic field produced by this coil which has an AC current running through it is an alternating magnetic flux. Let me bring the compass needle here. Yep. So this is another coin. It's totally not connected to this coin, but it experiences an alternating magnetic flux that's produced by this coin. And as a result, there's an induced EMF and an induced current running in this coin. You can see the bulb blinking quite dimly here. So what can we do to make this bulb brighter? Well, you can increase the magnetic flux linkage of this coin. So the easiest way is probably to just uh, bring it closer. Yeah, so you can see it blinking uh, brighter now. Ah, why not we just put it together with the primary coin. This coin now experiences a much larger magnetic flux linkage and therefore the rate of change of flux linkage is also higher and therefore the magnitude of the induced EMF and induced current is also uh, larger. There's an option here for me to increase the number of loops. So let's try that. Oh, the maximum is three. Ah, ayo, so lousy. Yeah, anyway, you see. So this is two loops, not so bright. Three loops, ah, brighter. If I bring it down to one loop, ah, it's even dimmer now. So remember, the flux linkage depends on the number of loops as well. So I've used the applet to remind you of um, electromagnetic induction. So now let's look at the basic construction and operation of a transformer. As I said, it's very simple. It's just made out of two coils of wires. One is called the primary coil. The other one is called the secondary coil. The primary coil is where we apply an input voltage, which is called VP. It's an AC voltage, which produces an alternating magnetic field. Does the secondary coil here experience a changing magnetic flux linkage? Yeah, it does, but it's a very weak one. Do you see all the flux going elsewhere, not passing through this uh, coil here? So to increase the magnetic flux linkage of the secondary coil, what we do is we wrap both coils around a soft iron core. With this soft iron core, the magnetic flux now goes this way. Just like an electric current flows in uh, wires of a closed circuit, the iron core kind of forms a closed magnetic circuit for the magnetic flux to flow around like this. So can you see what the soft iron core is for? First, it minimizes flux linkage. See, no flux is going elsewhere now. Everything produced here is linked to the secondary coil. Secondly, it actually increases the magnetic flux also. Remember, soft iron is a ferromagnetic material. It has a very high magnetic permeability. So the magnetic flux produced when there's this iron core is much higher than if it's an air core, if it's just empty air here. So look at this secondary coil. It's experiencing a changing magnetic flux linkage, doesn't it? So what does Faraday's law say? There's going to be an induced EMF denoted by ES across the secondary coil. And according to Faraday's law, we can write ES to be equals to negative NS d phi dt. So NS is the number of turns in the secondary coil. Now look at the primary coil. Does it experience a uh, changing magnetic flux linkage? It does, right? So what does Faraday's law say? There's going to be an induced EMF denoted by EP across the primary coil itself. Then some students will say, hey, isn't this magnetic flux produced by primary coil itself? So the primary coil is producing a magnetic flux that induces an EMF in itself? Wow, you're so right. Yeah, it's called self-induction. But self-induction is not in the A-level syllabus. So all you're required to do is to say, oh, according to Faraday's law, there's going to be an induced EMF in a primary coil that can be written as NP d phi dt. So NP is the number of turns in a primary coil. Now you look at this equation and you look at this equation. What do you want to do with them? Divide them, right? And ta-da, you get the induced EMF follows the turn ratio. Now, do you appreciate that having no flux leakage actually simplifies our analysis a lot? Because there's no flux leakage, the primary coil and the secondary coil experience the same exact changing magnetic flux. 
So the defy dt and the defy dt here are exactly the same. That allows us to cancel these two neatly when we divide these two equations. Now if you put a voltmeter across these two terminals, you're going to measure a voltage Vs. And that voltage is exactly equals to Es, isn't it? Assuming the coil has zero resistance. Now how about here? Vp is actually exactly equals to Ep also. Assuming the primary coil has no resistance at all, then Vp better be exactly equals to Ep. If not, an infinitely large current will be flowing through your primary coil and your primary coil will melt down immediately. So some people call this the back EMF. Is this back EMF matching VP that ensures that only a negligible amount of current passes through the primary coil when we are still having an open circuit here. So if VP is close to EP and VS goes to ES, then we can rewrite this equation as this. VS over VP is equal to NS over NP. So the ratio of the voltages follows the ratio of the turns exactly. Meaning if this coil has half the number of turns as this coil, then this voltage will be half of this. Conversely, if this coil has twice the number of turns as the primary coil, then the secondary voltage will be twice the primary voltage. Okay, now having a voltage is not enough, right? you must be able to push a current as well. So let's say we connect a load here to the secondary coil. So Vs is going to push a current through this resistor. So now we have Is, the current in the secondary coil. This is of course an AC current, yeah, because Vs is an AC voltage. Now Is flowing through the secondary coil should result in an additional magnetic flux in the iron core, which means something must happen in the primary coil. And in fact, what happens is very, very clever. An additional current denoted by IP will now flow in the primary coil. And the magnetic flux produced by IP exactly cancels the magnetic flux produced by IS. So actually there's no additional magnetic flux in the iron core, even though there's now a current IS flowing in the secondary coil because IP has taken care of it. So this thing here is actually called mutual induction. Again, mutual induction is not in the A-level syllabus. So if you don't know mutual induction, how are you going to figure out the relationship between IS and IP? Ah, for that, you are going to use the shortcut called principle of conservation of energy. I'm sure you agree that whatever power delivered here must have come from here. So the power drawn from the primary supply must be equal to the power dissipated in the load here, which means we can write VPIP to be equal to VSIS. Now you rearrange the terms, you can get IS over IP to be equal to VP over VS. But the voltage ratio follows the turn ratio, isn't it? So we can rewrite this as IS over IP to be equal to NP over NS. So the current ratio also follows the turn ratio, but it's the inverse turn ratio. Meaning if the number of turns here is half the number of turns here, then IS is two times IP. If the secondary coil has twice the number of turns as the primary coil, then the secondary current is only half of the primary current. Okay, a quick summary. We start with the primary supply producing an alternating magnetic flux in the iron core, which results in the induction of EMFs in both the primary and secondary coils. Because there's no flux leakage, the magnetic flux passing through both coils are exactly the same. So the difference in the flux linkage is only due to the different number of turns they have. In fact, the voltage ratios follows the turn ratio. So given any primary voltage, by choosing the number of turns in your coils, you can achieve any output voltage you want. When you connect a load, you get IS and IP flowing in both coils. In fact, the magnetic flux produced by IS and the magnetic flux produced by IP cancel each other out. They happen together. Sometimes you can't even tell whether IP is due to IS or IS is due to IP. There's kind of a magnetic telepathy, you know, that whatever power demanded here is met by drawing power from the primary supply. And the current ratios follows the inverse turn ratio. So you can see how useful the transformer is when it comes to power transmission. At the power stations, the electric generators produce a voltages of not that high, you know, 12 kV. If you put this voltage directly onto your transmission lines, the I square R losses in the cables will be too large. So what we do is to step it up to a much higher voltage, say 400 kV. So to step up 12 kV, to 400 kV, you need a step up transformer. In fact, you need a 1 is to 33 step up transformer. If you take 400 kV divided by 12 kV, you get about 33. That's where I get the 1 is to 33 ratio from. By stepping the voltage up 33 times, you step down the current 33 times. So if you think of I square R, if I is chopped down by 33 times, then I square R is chopped down by about 1000 times. Amazing, isn't it? With such a simple device, just two coils of wire around an iron core. 
but you can now have 400 kilovolts coming out from your wall sockets, you know. If you have 400 kilovolts in your wall socket, you see electric arcs all over your house. So what we do is to step down the voltage using a step down transformer so that consumers have a safer voltage to work with. If you take 400 kilovolts divided by 230 volts, it shows that uh, we need a step down transformer with a turn ratio of 1800 is to 1. So having the transformer that allows us to step up and step down AC voltages is crucial in making the AC transmission system much more efficient than the DC one. But some students are going to ask, why didn't Edison use the transformer to step up his DC voltages? Hmm, I wonder why. 